Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Hello and welcome to NJ Spotlight News. I'm Joanna Gagas, in for Brianna Venozzi. Governor Murphy today signed an extension of the state's public health emergency for another 30 days. That's set to expire right after the mask mandate will end in schools. Many parents are counting down the days until they can send their kids out the door without a mask, but that won't apply to kids who take the bus. The federal government still requires masking on all public transportation, and here in New Jersey, those rules govern school buses as well. But as parents consider what the new normal in schools will look like, some have concerns about their kids' safety. The number of new COVID cases has been trending down, although today they jumped to more than 2,600 new cases, up from about 1,800 yesterday. And while about 77 percent of eligible New Jersey residents have now completed their primary vaccination series, the vaccination rates among young people are far behind adults. And when you break it down by age, the rates get lower the younger you go. So has the needle moved as far as it's likely to go when it comes to the little ones getting their shots? Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan heard from several parents about their stance on the issue. Governor Murphy's dropping school mask mandates and he's partly banking on more kids getting vaccinated to raise COVID immunity rates in New Jersey classrooms. But for many parents, that's just not on the front burner. We still want to get them vaccinated, but I don't, the rush isn't there, you know. Mom Jessica Vanneman says it's a tough call. Her four-year-old, Wren, just recovered from COVID, and she's still wrestling with getting him vaccinated, even though her older kids did get COVID shots. We're not necessarily going to jump and get him vaccinated right away. Um, we think it might be better to just wait it out a little bit. Um, and see how it works out in this, you know, spring and summer time frame. I don't want my kid to get sick or anybody else's kid to get sick. I'm also six months pregnant, so I don't want to get sick. Um, so it's, it's scary. Lauren Anderson can't wait to get her four-year-old daughter, Ariel, vaccinated. But for Stephanie DiPergio, who says she follows a holistic lifestyle, it's a hard no. Right now, we are not choosing to get vaccinated. We did have COVID in our house already this past winter. DiPerzio's three kids already had COVID, but these three New Jersey moms perfectly illustrate what's going on with kids and COVID shots in New Jersey. Right now, about 60% of 12 to 17-year-olds are fully vaccinated, but only about 29% of 5 to 11-year-olds. Parents' concerns? We haven't had a long enough time period to observe um, how effective the vaccine is, but also, and perhaps more importantly, whether there's some side effects of the vaccine. Rutgers researcher Catherine Oginova says no evidence to date suggests serious adverse effects for kids. In a recent survey called COVID States Project, she discovered parents of older kids feel more confident they'd get children vaccinated, 68% of 12 to 18 year olds, but that dropped below 60% for 5 to 11s, and only about half half for kids under five, assuming Pfizer's two-dose regimen for youngest children wins emergency FDA approval. Montclair epidemiologist Stephanie Silvera predicts. Within the first two weeks or so of the vaccine being available, there is a rush for people who want it, and then it wanes very quickly. Um, a lot of parents have said, well, I don't, again, I don't think COVID is as, as dangerous to my children. Um, as it is to older adults, so my kids don't need to be vaccinated. Psychologists explain parents also fear feeling tremendous guilt. If I make this choice to get my child vaccinated and something bad happens, then that was something that I um, affirmatively did. She says many parents would rather not make that choice. Moreover, politics has increasingly polarized that decision. COVID states project found more than 80 percent of Democrats would vaccinate their kids, around 60 percent of independents, but only 54% of Republicans, and Silvera sees another drag on vaccination rates. Ironically, I think people are counting on antivirals, which are also very new, 
to come to the rescue rather than vaccines because we live in a world where um, treatment is preferred over prevention. So she says Governor Murphy shouldn't count on big spikes in kid vaccinations. For Vanneman, it's also a matter of how long the shots would last. Will her kids need boosters? And Ren? I will vaccinate my son in the fall especially if case if we get a new variant. She'd feel more motivated if COVID shots were mandated for kids, but that's a political third rail Trenton lawmakers seem unlikely to grab anytime soon. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. New Jersey has spent at least $9.5 million to test public workers through the state's VAX or test rule established by Governor Murphy last fall. That's according to WNYC that obtained records of the payments made by the state to its primary testing provider, Vault Health. About 26% of state workers are still unvaccinated, but that number varies by department, as WNYC's New Jersey reporter Karen Yee joins me now to explain. Karen, break down for us where taxpayer dollars have gone in terms of testing of unvaccinated public employees. Well, we were able to obtain a ledger that showed how much each department and agency spent to pay their primary uh, testing provider, which is Vault Health. And this showed about $9.5 million went to testing employees under this vaxxer test rule that Governor Murphy instituted for mer most workers in mid-October. Um, and some of the agencies that stood out, you know, you have Department of Health with 1.8 billion, 1.8 million, um, uh, Law and Public Safety with 1.9 million. And this sort of makes sense. I mean, these are some of the bigger departments. The health department also spent some of the, their funds on testing residents in community hotspots. And Law and Public Safety, obviously you have the Attorney General's office and the state police. Yeah, actually, I, I noticed Department of Corrections has the lowest vaccination rate. Um, it, it, just explain kind of where we see the, those disparities. Yeah, so what we looked at is we looked at the ledger of payments and we kind of compared those numbers to put them in context with the vaccination rates, as you mentioned. And we did find a correlation, um, which was if you had fewer uh, totally completely vaccinated employees, you were actually spending more to vaccinate the staff that wasn't, uh, sorry, more to, to uh, test the staff that wasn't vaccinated. And so you did see the Department of Corrections with the lowest vaccination rate among all agencies and departments at 41%, and that's 41% of about 8,000 employees. But the Department of Corrections actually uses a different testing provider. They go through their uh, medical provider at Rutgers. So we weren't able to obtain that cost breakdown that we were able to look at for other departments. And the Department of uh, Corrections does testing a little bit differently where They've been testing everybody, whether you're vaccinated or not, since May of 2020. And they're testing uh, prisoners as well, and they're, and they're testing contractors. So the DOC did give us an estimate of about $68 million that they've spent on testing. But again, there's that's you're, you're talking about 20,000 people in this pool of testers, right? Vaccinated and not vaccinated. So it was, it was hard to extra extrapolate a figure there to make a fair apples to apples comparison. What was the time frame and can we kind of extrapolate from that what this will cost the state if it continues on an ongoing basis testing in this way? Right. I mean, we looked at records from October to February, early February, you know, three and a half month period. It's about three million roughly, you know, that we're, we're spending every um, every 30 days or so. And I think these numbers may go down um, as more and more people get vaccinated, as they feel more comfortable getting vaccinated. I mean, the state overall has a pretty high vaccination rate of 74% for all of its state workers, but it's definitely a cost that's going to continue, right? I mean, when we give people the option to test out, uh, you know, this is something that's costly. Big numbers we're talking about here. Karen Yee, thank you so much. Thank you. Early in the pandemic, New Jersey's prisons had the highest COVID death rates of any other prisons in the nation. That led Governor Murphy to launch a program called Public Health Credits, which allowed inmates who only had a year or less left in their prison sentence to be released up to eight months early. And back in November 2020, 2,000 such inmates walked free in a single day. The number reached 5,000 by the time the program ended this past October. But with the governor's recent public health emergency declaration, the program was reactivated, and today 260 more inmates were released. Raven Santana was there to get reactions and to see how these prisoners are being supported once they're out. Obviously very excited, but a lot of people who aren't addicts don't understand the, the, the anxiety that comes with it. You know, it's, it's a scary feeling to come out here and know that you're one bag away from dying. So it's, it's definitely uh, a lot of anxiety. 
Michael Salsano is one of more than 260 inmates that were released from prisons and halfway houses earlier today under Governor Murphy's public health credit program. The program was prompted after New Jersey's prisons at one point had the highest COVID death rate in the country. It allows inmates within a year of their release date to be released up to eight months earlier. More than 5,000 inmates received early releases in the first iteration of the program, and the initiative was revived when Governor Murphy declared another public health emergency in January. If I didn't have an ID, if I didn't have food, if I didn't have shelter, if I didn't have a job, if I didn't have money in my, my pocket, what would I do? And if I didn't have like the support of a church or a community or a mosque, I mean, what would I do? You, you have to survive. Former New Jersey Governor Jim McGreevy is chairman of New Jersey Reentry Corporation, a nonprofit agency that helps people who have been incarcerated find jobs and housing. McGreevy joined about a dozen volunteers and staff outside Newark Penn Station to meet and help some of the newly released inmates with basic necessities. We're welcoming people as they come out, uh, giving them a backpack with you know underwear, socks, toiletries and connecting them to services. You just have to fill up this part here. What we want to do is make sure we have those people close to us, those folks, and help them with their ID, help them with their federal and state benefits. So New Jersey Reentry now has 13,000 program participants and reentry works but it's only works is if we have hand in glove. Staff here says a majority of those being released do not have a place to go, which is why they say having access to a variety of resources is critical to their transition. You have to think a lot of them due to addiction ended up in prison and they've burnt a lot of bridges, you know, so they have to build back those those relationships with their with their families you know, in order for the families to really say, okay, you could come home because maybe they don't think that prison did it for them. Republican lawmakers voiced their opposition, calling the governor to terminate the early release, including state Senator Joe Panaccio, who said the governor was using the pandemic as a cover for turning criminals loose. But McGreevy argues that couldn't be further from the truth, calling the release a second chance at life for many of them. Our recidivism rate is very low and our reincarceration rate is even lower. It's under 10%. So reentry works provided people are in a reentry program are fully engaged. And it's almost as if we're providing structure, 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 consistency and constancy. And that's what's so important. I'm living proof. You know what I mean? If you give yourself a chance and believe and keep the faith, you will be successful. 53-year-old Calvin Bass was released last June after spending 38 years in prison. Today, he works as a volunteer to help and assist those who may feel hopeless about their future. If you don't have that support and that moral support, you know what I'm saying, and encouraging world people just around you and encourage you to go forward, of course you're going to relapse and go back into the familiar things that you once done that got you locked up. McGreevy says that the agency will spend the next nine months closely assisting those who were released and continue to track them for the next three years. Under the newly reactivated program, Jersey could see more inmates released soon. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. For more on the COVID-19 prisoner release program, check out Taylor Jung's reporting at njspotlightnews.org. Many college students are in crisis. Even though many are back on campus this year after COVID closures last year, 70% of students say they're dealing with more mental health and financial stress than ever before. And the toll is greater on minority students who lost jobs during the pandemic at higher rates than their white counterparts. The findings come from a questionnaire conducted by the Office of the Secretary of Higher Education that surveyed 15 and a half thousand college students from 60 different higher ed institutions across New Jersey. The office plans to use the data to determine how to better support these young people with increased student services. Have charter schools fallen prey to politics? That's the allegation made by some as the Murphy administration once again blocked the expansion of several charter schools. One in three students attends a charter school in Newark, the state's largest city, and advocates of charters say there's no reason to stop their growth, especially considering the higher rates of success their students tend to have. But others say funds flowing to the charters mean less money for district schools, making it harder for those students to succeed. Melissa Rose Cooper takes a deeper dive into the issue. Please, um, you know, overturn the decision that you guys made because um, 
We need schools like this in our community. Danielle Burgess pleading with the Department of Education to change its mind and allow the Achievers Early College Prep Charter School in Trenton to expand beyond the ninth grade. Burgess's daughter is set to go into the 10th grade next year, but she says the state's denial is creating a major setback. I've been in my mind thinking of other options, and honestly, I really can't think of any because I am a single mother of three. And I do have an older child, which is in private school. I take education very seriously in my household. So I want my child to get the best education possible. So therefore, I know personally I can't afford to put two kids in private school. Charter school advocates say the state's recent decision to deny several charters expansion requests puts tens of thousands of New Jersey parents in a similar spot. The Department of Education cited various reasons for the denials. Some schools were deemed academically low performing, while the state said others hadn't hit their current enrollment caps. The Education Law Center has filed lawsuits challenging Newark's charter expansion. Its executive director, David Shara, agreed with the state's decision. Basically what the department found, at least two of these charters have a, have significant ability to expand now, which they received some years ago, and they haven't used it up. Uh, in one case, the North Star Charter School has over a thousand, or is close to a thousand approved expansion seats, if you will. They could enroll another a thousand thousand children, and um, they haven't used it. Uh, so, I'm not sure what anyone's complaining about these decisions make it clear that there just isn't the demand for this kind of expansion. But advocates say the state's decisions don't take a look at the entire picture. Charter schools do not get facilities money uh, and it takes time to find the right building. They have thousands of students on wait lists. So this is not about demand. It is about facilities and smart growth. It takes time to get the teachers in place, to get leadership in place, to get the facilities up in order uh, to serve students. We've never, ever, ever been hell no charters. Governor Murphy addressed the criticism from charter advocates at a press conference Monday, stating his administration had approved all requests for charter renewal and approved several schools' requests to expand. The fact of the matter is we've, we have, from moment one, have said we're, we're not about labels. We want to make sure the, the, the data that we all make these decisions uh, on across the spectrum of schools, whether it's charter, district, magnet, uh, private, whatever it might be, that we're all reading from the same set of facts. The new chair of the Senate Education Committee says he wants to work with the administration to improve the system. One of the things I'd like to see in the charter school renewal process is I want to see more public transparent process. I can give you an example in Red Bank, where the charter school was just recently renewed for five years, the public school there had some concerns. Um, all they could do is really both sides, from what I understand, could just submit paper, but there was no actual ability to meet. There's no ability for the public to engage. I think that is really problematic and, and can make the process incredibly bureaucratic. Charter school advocates say they'll be appealing the denials in hopes the Department of Education will hear their concerns. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. Do you feel like you're paying more these days for, well, just about everything? Rhonda Schaffler is here to explain how prices continue to surge. She has that, plus all the other top business stories. Rhonda, what is happening with inflation? Joanna, there is no let up to sky high prices that are impacting both residents and businesses. Consumer prices rose more than expected over the past year, according to the latest reading of the CPI. That's an index used by the government to track the price of products. Inflation surged seven and a half percent on an annual basis. It is the highest reading in nearly 40 years. The cost of basics like food and shelter are still rising. There was a big jump in energy costs and car prices. In fact, used car prices have risen more than anything else, up more than 40 percent over the past year. The state will soon accept applications for a new round of funding for those interested in participating in the Sustain and Serve program. That program provides organizations with grants to purchase meals from New Jersey restaurants impacted by COVID-19. The organizations then deliver those meals at no cost 
to residents in need. The state is allocating $10 million of federal COVID relief money for this latest phase of Sustain and Serve and is expected to start taking applications on March 1st. The head of the Small Business Administration, Isabella Guzman, is marking Black History Month by stating that the SBA is committed to breaking down barriers for Black-owned businesses who can't obtain capital and other resources. In New Jersey, there is some headway on that front, according to John Harmon, who leads the African-American Chamber of Commerce in New Jersey. We're making progress, particularly, uh, Rhonda, the, the corporate sector in New Jersey uh, banks, corporations are making um, outreach that is very substantive. In other words, trying to figure out how they can introduce Black businesses to resources, opportunities, and information to ultimately uh, contribute to their success. Harmon believes more movement is needed in the public sector. He'd like to see an increase in the number of state contracts awarded to minority firms. Finally, New Jersey will be receiving more than $15 million to help build out electric vehicle charging stations. Congressman Frank Pallone announced the funding amount today, which is part of an effort to build the first ever national network of EV chargers. Now, here's a check on Wall Street trading for today. I'm Rhonda Schapler, and those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by NJCU School of Business, a game-changing force offering programs like financial technology or business analytics and data science. We're steps away from the Exchange Place Path train in Jersey City and minutes from Wall Street. Learn more at njcu.edu slash gamechanger. And make sure you tune in to NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. This weekend, she puts the state of black businesses in focus, highlighting the progress made for business owners, the challenges they face gaining financial support, and how owners are empowering each other. Check it out on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel, Saturdays at 10 a.m. Could offshore wind turbines actually be bad for the environment? That's a question researchers are exploring as they try to better understand the impact of wind turbines on marine life, and more specifically on the endangered North Atlantic right whale. The Biden administration has put federal dollars behind the research as offshore wind developers move ahead with plans to install 200 or so turbines off the Jersey Shore. Can the two coexist? Contributing writer John Hurdle joins me now to talk about it. John, offshore wind turbines sound like a great thing for New Jersey, right? But what are the, the concerns around the impact on whales? Uh, well, one of the concerns is that the, off, the offshore wind farms um, might, in, in fact, uh, uh, interfere with the migratory routes of the, of the whales. Uh, other concerns include um, uh, disturbance by, um, uh, dur uh, by, as a result of noise during construction. Uh, and then there's a concern about uh, the, the number of uh, recreational fishing boats uh, that might actually uh, disturb the waters where these, uh, where these very rare um, mammals swim. Um, there's, a, there's an expectation that, the, um, uh, that uh, populations of fish will actually increase uh, as around the uh, reef like conditions created by these wind farms uh, and then um, and that of course will uh, will bring um, will bring uh, recreational fishermen and so so that's uh, uh, potentially uh, another source of disturbance to these animals I want to drill down a little bit more into this sound issue and the booms that are happening with construction it's not just like the typical sounds of construction there's major disruptions that could happen here yes uh, well, yes, I think these whales are, are, are whales in general, and perhaps the uh, the North uh, the North Atlantic right whale in particular uh, are are very much uh, susceptible to uh, the the noise created during construction. Uh, there will be piles being sunk into the seabed to uh, support these uh, giant turbines that will be built there, uh, and, and so um, uh, so there's a lot of concern about uh, about whether this will. Uh, uh, whether all that activity is going to uh, uh, create some disturbance. So just quickly, what is the research being done around this? And it does it look like there's a path forward? 
Uh, well, I, I think that the fact is that there is that people don't yet know enough about how um, a, endangered species like the North Atlantic right, right whale would be disturbed or, or would be uh, potentially harmed uh, by the uh, the offshore wind, uh, by the budding offshore wind industry, uh, and that the federal agency that controls this uh, is uh, saying that they. Um, you know they need to do a lot more research into this, and I'm hearing the same thing from uh, from an, a whale expert at Rutgers University. She uh, she welcomed um, the the, uh, the new federal initiative to uh, to look into this further. Absolutely, John Hurdle. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And that does it for us tonight. But if you missed any of the political headlines this week, tune in to Reporters Roundtable tomorrow morning. This week, senior correspondent David Cruz talks with Mayor Andre Saya about calls for bail reform and discusses the newly lifted school mask mandate with a panel of reporters. That's tomorrow morning at 10 on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel or wherever you stream. I'm Joanna Gagas. Thanks for being with us tonight. We'll see you back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and by the PSEG Foundation. Orsted will provide renewable offshore wind energy, jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Orsted, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Online at us.orsted.com.